My name is Suzanne O'Brien. I teach Japanese history here at, uh, at Boston University. And um, that doesn't sort of suggest an obvious relationship to this panel. So um, since I'm going to be introducing our speakers and inviting them to talk about a dialogue on love and, and their relationship to it, I feel like it's only fair that I say something about my own relationship to, to this text. Which, I've brought my sort of grubby and well-thumbed well copy, <laughs> um, which I got the hardcover actually because, um, or I'm glad that I did, because it's really a book that I go back to. I read it and reread it and have done so over the past 10 years um, because at various stages of my life, the, the issues that it engages um, between sort of, you know, her fearlessness in, in therapy to uh, dealing with cancer and dealing with grief and loss have, have been themes that have really um, made this, this text uh, not only meaningful, but really in some ways essential in my life. And um, I really, I'm really excited today to be able to, um, you know, bring uh, our speakers here to be able to talk to you about their relationship to this text. And hopefully for people who haven't read it before and got a chance to read um, a taste of it, will be encouraged to, um, to read the whole book and, and hopefully it will become as sort of um, a wonderful, as wonderful a sort of talisman for you as it, I feel like it has become for me. Um, so, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker, um, Ed Cohen. Ed teaches cultural studies and directs the PhD in program in women and gender studies at Rutgers University. His recent book, A Body Worth Defending, Immunity, Biopolitics, and the Apotheosis of the Modern Body, um, was just published by Duke University Press. He is currently working on two books, Overachiever, um, Shit Happens, or What I Learned About Healing from Living with Crohn's Disease, and um, Healing Tendencies, or Practical Ontology. In 1988, he was a co-recipient of the MLA's Crompton Knoll Prize um, with uh, Professor Eve Sedgwick, and um, he tells us that this has remained a sort of highlight of his career. So, thank you, Ed. Thank you. Um, the title of this talk is The Courage of Curiosity or The Heart of Truth. And the genre is a mashup. Um, if you watch Glee, you'll know what I mean. And if you don't watch Glee, you should. <laughs> the epigraph comes from an interview with Michel Foucault called The Masked Philosopher. Curiosity is a vice that has been stigmatized in turn by Christianity, by philosophy, and even by a certain conception of science. Curiosity, futility. The word, however, pleases me. To me, it suggests something altogether different. It evokes concern. It evokes the care one takes for what exists or could exist, a readiness to find strange and singular what surrounds us, a certain relentlessness to break up our familiarities and to regard otherwise the same things, a fervor to grasp what is happening and what passes, a casualness in regard to the traditional hierarchies. I dream of a new age of curiosity. If you knew Eve Sedgwick, either through her writing or through her life, or even better, through both, you know that in addition to being an incredibly kind person, an incredibly generous person, and an incredibly compassionate person, she was also an incredibly curious person in all the relevant senses. Those of us here in this room today have probably all been the beneficiaries of Eve's curiosity in one way or another. And so to honor this gift of curiosity that we have received from her, I want to spend a few minutes unpacking a curious coincidence. When I read Kathy Davidson's post saying that Eve had slipped into the bardo, itself a curious idiom for announcing a death in academe, I was in the middle of the last volume of lectures that Foucault gave at the Collège de France called Le Courage de Vérité, The Courage of Truth. Once I heard of Eve's transition, I could not help but read the rest of his text with her in mind. Perhaps from my title, you, have already, you already have an intimation of why this curious connection inspired my thoughts about Eve. In addition, Kathy's post had asked us to send Eve energy through her passage, uh, in her passage through the bardo. And my immediate inclination was that the best way that I could help was to ask Foucault to guide her. I hope that the following description of Foucault's ultimate lectures will help you understand why. In the months immediately preceding his death from AIDS in 1984, beleaguered by Ill the illnesses that caused him first to delay and then to interrupt his usual schedule of meetings, Foucault offered his final course. 
The transcripts are profoundly moving, not just on this account, but even more so because a number of the lectures take as their nominal subject Plato's dialogues on the death of Socrates, himself yet another famously curious subject. Foucault engages the Socratic death scene as bespeaking the philosopher's final reflections on his relation to politics, to life, and to truth. In order to do so, Foucault focuses on the Greek concept of parisia, roughly truth-telling, very dear in the French, in order to frame his own final meditation on the practice of truth. The topic of Parisia dominated the last two years of Foucault's public lectures. His ruminations on Parisia distinguish among a number of conventional kinds of truth-telling or regimes of truth, that of the prophet, the sage, the teacher, and the Parisiast. Each of these figures personifies a different speech situation in which the relation between knowledge and truth unfolds as a di distinct mode of relating among people. The prophet's concerns destiny, the sage's concerns being, the teacher's concerns techne, and the Parisiast's ethos. About the latter, he says, Parisia is not a métier. It is something more difficult to encompass. It is an attitude, a manner of being which concerns virtue, a manner of doing or making. But that is not all that characterizes this regime of truth, for what put, puts Parisia into play is the risk that this attitude or manner entails. Quote, Parisia implies a strong and constitutive tie between the one who speaks and what is said, and moreover by the effects of truth themselves, by the wounding effects of truth, the possibility of a rupture of the tie between the one who speaks and the one who is addressed. The Parisiast would be the courageous speaker of a truth in which the speaker risks him or herself and his or her relations with the other. Foucault foregrounds two distinct contexts in which this kind of risk takes place. The first is the polis, where the risk involved in the relation among speaker and auditors inheres in the political nexus from which the speech arises, be it monarchy, oligarchy, or democracy. Socrates' condemnation and death exemplify the significant risk of this kind of truth event, precisely insofar as it foregrounds the mortal consequences entailed by the political decisions regarding truth. Through his death, Socrates evinces the philosophical relation to truth, a relation which he holds as an imperative enjoined upon him by the gods, i.e. as the command of an other, more perfect world which he, upon which he willingly stakes his soul. Quote, the death of Socrates founds a form of veridiction precisely proper to philosophical discourse, which must, which must exercise courage until the moment of death as a proof of the soul which, can ha which cannot have its place before the political tribune. The second context is not exactly the agora, but more like the crossroads, the public place from which the cynic, particularly as personified by Diogenes, speaks back to power, even to the monarch himself, as a sovereign subject whose self-relation manifests the truth precisely insofar as it refuses to exceed any authority whatsoever over its truth. As Foucault says, quote, cynicism poses a very grave question. In order to truly be the life of truth, must life not be an other life, a life radically and paradoxically other? Must not the true life be a life radically and paradoxically other, because it cannot do other than put into practice the practices most commonly admitted among current philosophy? The true life isn't it and mustn't it be the other life? Between these two situations, the polis and the crossroads, and between these two figures, Socrates and Diogenes, Foucault identifies the forms for truth-telling which have, since then, transected Western philosophy across two divides. As he wrote in what are literally the very last words we have from him, these possibilities address either the other world or the other life. Quote, imposing the question of the rapport between the care of the self and the courage of truth it seems that Platonism and cynicism represent two great forms which each face the other and which each give rise to a different genealogy. On the one side, the psyche, the knowledge of the self, the work of purification, access to the other world. On the other side, bios, the proof of oneself, the reduction to animality, the struggle between this world against the world. But what I would like to insist on to finish is this. There is no instauration of the truth without an essential position of otherness. Truth is never the same. 
it can only be truth in the form of the other world or the other life. I hope that in my reading of these citations, you can hear the resonances of Eve's Parisia, her rel relentless yearning both for the other world and the other life, her refusal to choose between one and the other, and her passionate curiosity about what weaves the two together, as both her texts and her textiles attest. However, what I also want to recall about Eve through these invocations of Foucault, a writer and thinker for whom she had great admiration, is what her life and her work help us recognize about what Foucault leaves out. While incredibly adept at reflecting on the practices and risks that truth entails, as well as on their conditions of possibility, Foucault doesn't tell us so much about the nature of the courage that the courage of truth requires. In other words, he doesn't have much to say about the cœur, the heart, that is at the heart of courage. Yet I think this is precisely what a dialogue on love reveals, that at the heart of truth lies love. In the spirit of full disclosure, let me begin by saying that I too love my therapist. <laughs> In fact, when a dialogue on love first appeared, I gave it to her as a Christmas present, which I thought was very Jewish of me. <laughs> What a dialogue in love makes palpable and its generous braiding together of perspectives and styles is precisely how the risk to pursue the truth makes this risk available as a risk of the self before the other. Or, to put it more simply, such risk is always already a relation. In the context of relative safety afforded by Shannon's regard, Eve courageously reveals both to him and to us the ways that she comes to risk herself, or at least what she had heretofore assumed as the contours of herself, by accepting the possibility that Shannon offers her other versions of herself which might be equally or even more true than the ones she affirms. This acceptance necessitates an opening of the heart, i.e. courage in its strongest etymological sense. It also requires love. Not just the transferential and counter-transferential love between the analyzand and the analyst, with its intersecting and overlapping one-way dynamics, but a context of love, an ambiance of love, a loving and compassionate eruption of the event which love bespeaks within and between sentient living beings. Given our culture's history of pathological individualism, which following C.B. McPherson we can call possessive individualism, such an event is needless to say risky. It makes one vulnerable as an individual and, given our political, economic, philosophical, and psychological prejudices, as a self. Yet it also paradoxically opens us to the possibility of healing. Curiously then, in The Courage of Truth, Foucault explicitly considers Socrates' philosophical practice in the light of, the, of Greek ideas about healing. Foucault describes the role of the philosopher in relation to the one he engages in dialogue, and given Socrates' penchants, such dialogues were often dialogues on love, as, quote, indicating what sort of actions he must perform and which ones he must avoid, discovering what are the true opinions which he must follow and what the false opinions which he must guard against. Through this, Socrates nourishes true discourse. While Foucault does not follow the threads that connect nourishment and love, the same cannot be said for Eve. In an episode near the end of the book, Eve describes how, after his heart surgery, she visits Shannon at his home, a reversal of context that opens not only a new phase of their dialogue, but also a new moment in Eve's relation to knowledge, to Buddhism, and to herself. I'm loving how pedagogy, the psychology of it, turns up at the center of everything in Tibetan Buddhism. It feels so Hamish, where the, diff the difficult part isn't what you need to know, but how to go about really knowing it. Acknowledging the reality, my brother would say. Realizing, being the slow learner. It's at Shannon's home that I say this, the first time that I've been there. I've brought a lunch for us, a heart-healthy one, and he narrates his hospital adventures. He's pale, slow, very shaken, and wearing shorts. Me, that outsized neck brace, one of those melting autumnal days in the South. The turn to Buddhism in the text, the embrace of what Eve says with my puritanical modernist aesthetic I used to think was embarrassing in a religion like Buddhism, bespeaks not just a personal affinity with the precepts of a tradition and a practice, but also a philosophical engagement with the effects of truth as a form of self-transformation, acknowledging the reality, realizing. However, it's not because you acknowledge the reality that makes a difference. It's that you do and how you do it. 
realizing matters. And like the lunch that precipitates it, it is heart healthy when it happens. In another series of lectures that he gave at the Collège de France entitled Hermeneutics of the Subject, Foucault considers a bifurcation in Western intellectual practice which he associates with the Cartesian moment between what he calls philosophy and what he calls spirituality. For philosophy, truth always already exists in the world and the function of knowledge is to define and refine methods that enable one to apprehend it. In other words, anyone can know the truth if you know the method, a principle on which modern science depends. For spirituality, however, in order to apprehend the truth, the knower must perform exercises and transformations on the self, which enable the self to consider and to appreciate the truth as such, or indeed to become truth worthy. The truth only appears as such within spirituality insofar as the performance conjures the truth by becoming like it, by manifesting it, by invoking it. If I say that a dialogue in love is a spiritual text, then I'm not just alluding to the Buddhist insights that it evokes, but also appreciating the transformative healing that it both describes and inspires. The work that the text engages, a work of writing, a work of collating, a work of relating, become through Eve and, and through us a work of reading, a work of gathering, a work of being. None of Eve's usual critical astuteness lacks here. There is nothing not philosophical here. Rather, the text's modus operandi evinces a careful, studious, and attentive reflection, in short, a curiosity, generously and genuinely addressed to its own verbal practice as a visceral process of growth and transformation. It is healing, then, because it does what it says. It pursues its th truth through all the snares and lures within which the self distinguishes, disguises itself in order to celebrate the love that makes the truth as truth desirable. In affirming a dialogue on love as spiritual in Foucault's sense, what I hope to suggest is that it hails us to another mode of knowing, another attitude, another manner of doing that our critical idioms all too often obscure or denigrate. A book on love, uh, dialogue on love is a curious book because it is a courageous book, a heartfelt book, and also a risky book, a book that risks the self in order to venture towards the truth. Willingly offering an open heart, it opens onto compassionate loving kindness, not only as a spiritual precept, but also as a philosophical practice. Thus, Eve's Parisia, her very dear, her relentless truth-speaking and seeking do more than inspire us. They show us what we as academics and intellectuals all too often fail to appreciate, that within the courage of curiosity lies the heart of truth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to um, move on to um, Michael Moon now. Michael Moon is a professor and the co-director of graduate studies at the Graduate Institute of Liberal Arts at Emory University. He has also taught at Johns Hopkins University and Duke University. His research interests encompass late 19th and early 20th century American literature and culture, including film, especially in relation to the history and theory of sexuality and of mass culture. He's published widely on topics ranging from male homoerotics of the classic American Horatio Alger story and domestic architecture vis-a-vis -vis queer theory to, um, in, in collaboration with Eve, Eve Sedgwick, the films of John Waters. Um, his uh, publications include A Small Boy and Others, Imitation and Initiation in American Culture from Henry James to Andy Warhol, Disseminating Whitman, Revision and Corporeality in Leaves of Grass, and Subjects and Citizens, Nation, Race, and Gender from Orinoco to Anita Hill. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks to you organizers um, for bringing this all together. You've done a fantastic job, and we're very grateful to you. I knew Ian Watt, the author of The Rise of the English Novel, a little in his later years. And he once told me a story about his having been one of the Cambridge undergraduates in the 1930s who had invited Gertrude Stein to speak at the university. The responsibility of meeting Gertrude Stein's train and entertaining her until time came for her lecture <laughs> fell to Ian Watt, 
It's oh my god. About twenty at the, at the time. <laughs> they could drink. <laughs> Tea. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Watt said he was a little concerned beforehand about whether undergraduate he was quite up to interacting with Stein, who was by this time a famously formidable person. So he was relieved on meeting her to discover that she seemed entirely good-natured. He probably did not know at the time that Stein had already made a career not only of very much making her own way, as an artist, but of helping ambitious young men around her. Hemingway, Aaron Copeland, Paul Bowles, Sam Stewart, Thornton Wilder, and many others make theirs. Stein was a dab hand of long experience at drawing out bright young men long before she met 20-year-old Ian Watt. Watt said he took Stein to a tea shop on the way to campus and they proceeded to chat amicably about her recent travels and about his studies at the university. That is, they continued to chat amicably until the door opened and into the otherwise nearly empty tea shop walked someone whom Watt had never seen before but recognized immediately from her photographs, Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Unfortunately for himself, Watt said, Stein also recognized Wolf <laughs> and appeared to him to plummet visibly into an immediate state of abjection. <laughs> A little black rain cloud formed over the table where Stein and Wolf sat <laughs> as Wolf was seated a few tables away and served her tea. The flow of conversation between Watt and his, dis his distinguished guest ended abruptly, never to be resumed. <laughs> Watt said he could all but hear Stein's miserable and resentful thought emanating from that celebrated brain, and they call that woman an experimental writer. <laughs> How unpleasant Stein seems to have found being unwittingly ambushed by the other most eminent inter international modernist woman writer <laughs> on Wolf's own turf, Cambridge being known even at the time to be the major academic outpost of Bloomsbury. After 10 or 15 long minutes of Stein's silent but eloquent seething, Watt said he suggested that perhaps they should be getting on to campus. <laughs> now I yield to no one in my admiration of Gertrude Stein's writing. But far from sharing her apparently invidious opinion of Wolf, I also very much esteem and have enjoyed teaching several of Wolf's books, especially Three Guineas and A Room of One's Own. Nevertheless, I was reminded of Ian Watt's story about Stein's harsh judgment of Wolf as being insufficiently audacious to her mind when I re recently reread Wolf's 1930 essay on being ill as I was preparing these remarks about illness in Eve Sedgwick's thinking and writing. In her essay, Wolf points out that to her puzzling absence from literature of illness and its effects, is there any other common field of ordinary human experience, she asks, as generally underrepresented in literature as illness is? But illness as a category remains small and domesticated in Wolf's evocation of it. She never seems to allow it to expand far beyond the head cold or the mild bout of flu. For me, Wolf's essay fails insofar as it, in a sense, trivializes its great subject. Perhaps my own great expectations that Wolf might have something really helpful and engaging to say about the relation of the experience of illness to writing uh, are unfair or at least irrelevant to her actual essay, insofar as they were founded on my sense of Wolf as someone who appears to have had profound and extensive experience of mental anguish and emotional pain. I had hoped that she might have brought her long struggle with psychic turbulence to bear on her thinking about illness and writing. Perhaps it would be fairer to look elsewhere in her writing, in some of her novels and diaries, for traces of her long engagement with navigating the defiles of so-called mental illness to its limits and to hers and to the limits of her writing. Uh, I believe it's Maggie Height who has an important essay called uh, uh, Vir the Virginia Woolf's Two Bodies, which is a helpful place for, uh, I think, for readers of Woolf to begin revisiting the question of embodiment um, and suffering and ecstasy and pleasure in Woolf's fiction. 
Although it's much less central, indeed entirely marginal, to her authorial legend, Stein, in much of her early writing, The Making of Americans, Three Lives, QED, and so on, engages at length with what had been, in a sense for her, the seriously sick-making effects of her experiences of being orphaned as an adolescent and as a young woman, having had a prolonged vocational crisis that led from, led her from her stellar performance as a Radcliffe undergraduate to being thrown out of Hopkins Medical School in her fourth year, to then wandering back and forth for several quite unhappy years among the cities of New York and London and Paris without finding a home in any of them, largely, we are told, to try to avoid re-encountering her ex, Mae Bookstaver whom she, by her own account, remained emotionally and psychically stuck on for years after their brief but intense involvement had ended. As some of you know, the only near rupture that we're aware of in the 40-year relationship of Stein and Toklas came when, far into their time together, Toklas discovered some old manuscript writings of Stein's and realized for the first time, or as if for the first time, how deeply Stein had remained in thrall to what she had experienced as, on her side, an unbreakable attachment to May Bookstaver for years after the ending of their early affair. As if the toxic qualities of the relationship were still highly contagious decades after its end, Toklas then appears to have succumbed to her own illness in the form of an obsessive jealousy that plagued both her and her partner for some time until, we're told, Stein finally informed Toklas that if she could not bring these feelings of hers under control, Stein was going to break off their relationship. Stein, you may recall, had been a brilliant student of William James's soon after the moment that clinical and experimental psychology had definitively emerged from philosophies of mind and the shock therapy to which she suggested subjected Toklas as far as one can tell from the outside and at this great distance, appears to have worked. I'm thinking about illness as both a circumstance and a subject of Eve Sedgwick's work. And in doing so, I've been grateful for the work of Wolf and Stein as other, and to my mind, comparably rich sites of writing that register the effects of pain and illness on thinking and writing. In a dialogue on love, Eve explores in collaboration with her sympathetic psychotherapist the roots of relation between her post-cancer diagnosis depression and her earlier struggles with sometimes powerful depressive tendencies. I understand a dialogue on love as having emerged as a quite remarkable set of responses and tactics from the crisis of self-intimacy that the onset of illness and the related waning of her hitherto reliably there libido and her more or less stable sense of her own embodiment that Eve experienced in the first years after her diagnosis. It's a crucially important document in the development of Eve Sedgwick's career, I believe, insofar as it represents the beginning of her work on affect, beginning characteristically with her own, and the culmination of her career as a poet, not just in the haiku form to which it keeps adverting, dialogue on love keeps adverting, but in the passage between prose and haiku and back to prose, and what they may suggest to us about her sense of the relations of form and its, uh, and its effects to illness and pain, and on illness and pain. Eve had made a brilliant first pass at theorizing the relation of poetic meter and form to spanking and being spanked, and to sadomasochistic experiencing, experiences and imaginings of pleasure and pain as early as her 1986 essay, A Poem is Being Written. Sedgwick repeatedly offered her st highly stylistically wrought accounts of herself and her exemplarily complex sexuality as new models for thinking and embodying and enacting sexualities and affects during the late 1980s from the time of the 1985 Poetics of Anger conference at Columbia um, uh, to a conference that she and I gave a joint paper at, at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee at the Center for 20th Century Studies. It was a conference on the emotions, and we were each supposed to choose one. Um, 
Um, down to her and Paula Bennett and my Muse of Masturbation panel at the 1989 MLA at a time in which it was still not, not quite possible for a, another year or two to think about um, sexualities like Eve's or many sexualities unlike Eve's in some ways as being in some sense queer. Only a year or two after that time, Eve found herself rejecting the attentions of the hospital counselors and support personnel who tried to engage with her about how the mastectomy she had just had might trouble her sense of her own femininity. It didn't seem the time or place for her to start trying to explain to them her own thinking about gender and identity. <laughs> they were there to help after all, and people in that position rarely listen to anything one says. Sorry, just my little sidebar on the helping professions. But, she's, but Eve spoke forthrightly to friends at the time about the at least partially delibidinizing and disembodying effects for her of suddenly and unexpected, unexpectedly coming to find herself seriously ill and undergoing the combined physical and psychic consequences of chemotherapy and radiation. What a challenge that must have come as to a committed and highly sex-positive feminist who had been instrumental in the immediately preceding years of making work like hers and Gail Rubin's, Linda Hart's, and Pat Califia's not only something that could be discussed, finally could be discussed across a wide swath of, of the academy, but now had to be discussed, at least in some um, precincts of the academy. For me, the work of Eves that seems still to have abundant generative potential for the ongoing process of rethinking illness, pain, and death in the contemporary world is her, uh, well, what I think of as her a late work on affect, but as, as I've just been suggesting, that work has roots that go way back in her career. When a man becomes ill, Svidrigailov famously tells Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, when a man becomes ill, another world begins to make itself known to him. What about when a woman becomes ill and when a queer becomes ill? Eve's writing about illness from the time of her much admired essay, White Glasses, her eulogy for Michael Lynch. Uh, from the time of White Glasses onward, her writing about illness emerged and derived some of its intellectual and emotional power from the renaissance of activism and writing about both breast cancer and HIV AIDS in the late 1980s and 1990s. One kind of work that itself draws powerfully on Eve's work with Adam Frank on affect is exemplified by Elizabeth A. Wilson's 2004 book, Psychosomatic, Feminism and the Neurological Body in ways that I feel Sedgwick would have applauded and enjoyed, Elizabeth Wilson, in her book, thinks through some of the consequences of some strands of feminist systems theories and feminist science studies taking seriously the idea that psyche and soma are mutually constitutive of each other and that the theorization and study of affect are crucial foci for the study of the complex wave of, uh, web of relationships that uh, help determine psyche and soma. For me, one of the highest values of Eve's work continues to lie in its world-making powers for herself, her friends, her students, her many readers. Eve saw with increasing clarity through the years of her own illness and of her work and of her work on understanding affect and its effects that of all pernicious dualisms, of all pernicious dualisms, perhaps the mind-body split was might be the most pernicious, and that it must make an immense difference in the quality of the kinds of worlds we are able to imagine building if body and mind are much more densely permeated with each other than we are used to thinking of their being. Thank you. And we're going to um, move, move on now to um, Professor Cindy Patton. She's a professor at Simon Fraser University. She holds a joint appointment in the departments of sociology and anthropology, as well as women's studies, and as the Canada Research Chair in Community, Culture, and Health. 
Um, she did her uh, PhD at the University of Amherst, and she's published work in the areas of uh, the social study of medicine, especially on AIDS, the social movement theory, gender studies, and media studies. Her current research interests include the social study of medicine, especially social aspects of AIDS and wilderness medicine, continental theory, and research design, especially mixed methods. Um, she was the co-editor of Queer Diasporas and a special issue of Cultural Studies on Pierre Bourdieu. And she's the author of such works as Globalizing AIDS, Cinematic Identity, Anatomy of a Problem Film, Fatal Advice, How Safe Sex Education Went Wrong, and Inventing AIDS. I'm going to make a replacement preface to the preface I wrote in the mode of the first panel and uh, tell you how I knew Eve. Um, I was, in fact, one of the editors of the journal, the Lesbian Sex Journal, in which the writings of the collective who will write this afternoon appeared. <laughs> so I knew Eve, but only as a number, because we didn't have the names of the individual people. We had great debates about whether we could publish anonymous works. Um, I got to know Eve over time just as a person. Uh, I had no intention of becoming an academic, and in fact, she more or less advised me against it, which <laughs> for a long time I considered bad advice, but more recently I've considered quite good advice. <laughs> um, we never talked about our work. I'm not sure we talked about all kinds of other things. We might have had conversations like some of the ones in this text, and I would have been a rather cranky interlocutor. I hope I'm not cranky in my comments on it today. I, in fact, put off reading a dialogue on love for quite a long time. I started it, found it irritating, and put it aside. There were, of course, for me, two Eves. The Eve that I knew as a friend, an almost opposite, and the Eve that I knew through her work. This was the text that brought those two into a kind of uh, absolute collision. And so in Discovering I had been assigned to read this book and comment on it for today, I read it start to finish a couple of times and then tried to make some sense of both my uh, appreciation for the text and also things about the text that didn't sit quite as well. Uh, reading the text fully and richly uh, had all the produced all the feelings that I'd feared over time as I'd kind of deferred reading this thing. Um, and it had a particular feeling now that Eve has gone. Uh, I was struck by her eloquence in conveying the gripping struggle with mortality, not first in the face of cancer or AIDS, but in the context of feeling out of place in the world. What ought I to make of this book in a public forum like the one today? How does one situate oneself as the reader of a text, especially one authored by someone one knew quite well, a text that, through graphics and shifts in voice, blurs the lines between forms of self-expression and forms of listening. That is, at some formal level, is a, itself a dialogue on dialogue. In the classroom, I'd be tempted to say, what was she saying? But I remember a conversation with Eve sometime in the late 1980s, I, I imagine. I was grappling with how to write elegantly and recursively, but clearly in the mode of the then popular deconstructionist high style. I think I said something like, I'm trying to communicate. And she interrupted me with a laugh in that high-pitched voice of hers, as delicate and tentative and unpredictable as a flat pebble skipped across the surface of a rippled pond. That's the difference, she said. She then described her own editing process and explained that however much she shaped her prose, it was the reader who would bend it to their place, to their meanings. Writing was poesis and not communication. I think a dialogue on love is perhaps Eve's own high watermark in this understanding of writing. The text plays hide and seek with the reader, offering various angles on her body and feelings and then confounding these with Shannon's, perpetually fusing fragments of poems with fragments of therapy notes, both the official record of the therapist and the reflexive extensions of her own therapy journals. 
The address of the text is so strong that it's hard not to read the text very personally as addressed to oneself, to me, even if you didn't know Eve. I want, though, to think about it as a kind of communication, and I want to place the text in the larger social context. As I take up this particular work of Eve's, I think of it as a kind of found interview, like the, um, the Ecole Beban and Pierre Riviere that Foucault found and offered. But I also want to think of it in relationship to Pierre Bourdieu's work, The Weight of the World, a sustained and two-pronged argument, both about the quotidian miseries that beset us in post-modernity, and on the other hand, the nature of reflexivity. Bourdieu's discussion of how the interviews were conducted and then edited, and why so many had to be thrown away, emphasizes the dynamic necessity of a closeness between interviewer and interviewee. Not the kind of cheesy modernist resort to some bedrock humanity that enables us to communicate across difference, but what he calls a structural homology of social location. He insists on the interviewer's studied ability to bring to bear the objective features of context that frame the specificity of the individual's life without subordinating the personal to the structural, but instead identifying the macrostructural features that are inflected in the, in the highly specific ways that cause the particular misery of particular individuals. I'll just put a note in here. Eve made me much smarter, perhaps not smart enough because it became a social scientist, <laughs> perhaps alone among the people that she hoped to smarten up. <laughs> For Bourdieu, this insistence on holding the intensely individual and the macrostructural intention with one another is not just a methodological requirement but an ethical demand. He calls this bifocal attention to the analysis of what I would call the dynamic mesospace, intellectual love. In this brief time, I want to think about love and family. Family as a source of misery and love as a means of conveying a capital that Bourdieu calls normalcy. I, this might be a critique of Eve's text, but she, I'm going to give her a rejoinder at the end. Used together to read Eve's text, these concepts sidestep the psychoanalytic categories deployed in her dialogue and sidestep the excruciatingly tempting psychoanalytic reading one wants to make of the text itself. If you've read the book, you know that one of Eve's intermittent tasks in therapy was to figure out what love is, what it is for others, and in a sense, what normal love is. Shannon's contribution, it seems, is to, is to operate both as a foil for these musings. He seems to have a more conventional, and Eve worries, dumb idea of what love is, and as the object of the feelings that Eve wants to call love and love will have to be in quotes from now on. This love is not specifically sexual, although it is not anti-sexual. And it is more than what some might gloss as platonic love. It has the quality of an intersubjective authenticity to it, concepts under intellectual and political scrutiny at the time of Eve's writing, and also concepts that are somewhat at odds with her work on the systems theorist Sylvan Tompkins. What love is remains undefined by the end of the book, as it should be, since in, in, it even tends to operate outside of the realm of indexicality. But it also remains obscure, since one has to get, um, since in order to get it, one has to get Eve in the way that she hopes Shannon has gotten her, a sustained act of poesis that I think remains obscure to many readers. I want to talk a little bit more about um, the interconnection between love and family. And to do this, I have to read some quick passages from Bourdieu. Bourdieu writes, to understand how the family turns from a nominal fiction into a real group whose members are united by intense affective bonds, one has to take into account all the practical and symbolic work that transforms the obligation to love into a loving dis disposition and tends to endow each member with the, of the family with a family feeling that generates devotion, generosity, and solidarity. And later he writes, the forces of fusion 
especially the ethical dispositions that incline the family's members to identify the particular interests of individuals with the collective interests of family, have to contain the forces of fission. That is, the interest of the various members of the group who may be more or less inclined to accept the common vision and more or less capable of imposing their own selfish point of view. In other words, for Bourdieu, um, the affect of love is very tied up with the power field of the family. It's less important whether one keeps or dispenses with the terms love or family, but rather to understand the way in which Bourdieu points to the structural dimension of the demands for what he calls a loving disposition. This most intensive and seemingly personally driven affect, this family feeling dispersed across the body of the family as well as the body of the individuals, serves as the currency, the capital at play in the force field of family. The oddball or queer member of the family is still part of the family as long as he or she identifies their interests with those of the family. That is, as long as they take the point of view of the family over their selfish point of view. Now Eve would remind me that in the passage she offers, there are two very interesting, or three very interesting moments. The first in which she realizes that Shannon has a uh, pre-conscious or conscious understanding of his job as reconciling Eve to her family. And she quite explicitly contests this, though not at length. We can just interpolate uh, a long history of feminist critique of the family into that. But the second two, two moments in the section that you've read are the two diagnoses that occur. The first, that of her brother-in-law, the husband of the sister that's been estranged from the family for about a decade. And the second, the diagnosis with, HMV, with CMV of her friend Gary Fisher. The CMV is a sequel A to his HIV. And it's just a kind of wonderful, wonderful um, uh, moment of uncertainty when she realizes that she can't remember exactly what CMV in, is and hasn't heard of it being in the stomach before. She ponders how to calibrate the grip, gripping ambivalence that the reunification that will result from her brother-in-law coming nearby for treatment will have with her unambivalent desire to jump on a plane and fly across the continent to be with Gary. And I think what we see here are the differences between a form of affect born of family feeling, that is one that is deeply felt but derived from a kind of systematic set of obligations, and an affect catalyzed from what Bourdieu in another place calls the homology of habituses. That is an affect that is embedded with forms of power and the submission of one's point of view to that of the family versus one that works across difference, that honors separations. Eve doesn't reconcile these, and I'm not sure that she um, would have herself completely noticed the tension between these two uh, diagnostic moments. Um, and I'll, um, but I think having, having a mother who turns out to be a lesbian, which is another uh, uh, plot line in the book, repositioned Eve from a potential parent who could bring up a kid who is gay to an adult child capable of recognizing the changing landscape of affection across the lifespan. Despite the entangled loves of her life, Eve managed to show how one might, if not always, love without obligation. take a, a page from Aaron's book and maybe give you a chance if, if you wanted to respond to one another um, to start that way and if there were tensions or things that you wanted to <laughs> discuss amongst <laughs> yourself <laughs> or not nah. or we could open it right up Listen. and where are our uh, microphones okay
killed. No. <laughs> Questions? Hi. Um, um, mm -hmm. uh, I was struck by the fact that you so vehemently resisted the ideal of, of interpreting this with a psychoanalytic mm -hmm. uh, perspective. Um, my name is Tracy. I'm a BU undergrad. But I'm now at Antioch University for psychology. And um, what occurred to me throughout this text was Freud's refer Freud calling psychoanalysis a cure through love and how intricately tied and how can you read it without a sort of psychological perspective and isn't it imbued throughout the text? Um, is that for me? Uh, I'm, I, I mean, oh, okay, sorry, you could. Yes, I think it's there, but I think it's only one way of understanding the experiences and the journey that she's trying to recount. And I think that's like, that's the argument I would have with her. Um, so there's a, for me, there's a kind of, um, and again, I think the, the, the other work, her other work on affect, I think, is an interesting tension with it, but I think there's a kind of um, naturalization of certain, certain of the affects that she is writing in that text. I just find it, I find the playing around love to be, um, I don't know, I would, I would have liked more, more friction, more tension in the kind of uses of that term itself. Because there are obviously many different kinds of loves happening in the text. And perhaps I'm a social scientist and I wanted <laughs> something less subtle. And the subtlety eluded me. I also think there's something going on in the text that's uh, a kind of self-mourning and a kind of uh, um, coming to self-awareness about that and a kind of exceeding of that difficult as that practice is to learn and to cultivate on one's own and one's loved one's behalf, that there is a kind of overcoming of that too. And I don't think uh, um, sort of Freudian paradigms um, are ones that Eve found uh, very helpful for that. And I think um, the importance of Sylvan Tompkins as a figure in experimental psychology, as, as for uh, Eve and, and others of us who've uh, uh, gotten increasingly interested in his work and in affect theory in general, it's, it's, a, it's a polemical choice against sort of leaving f of certain um, received versions of Freud and Freudianism at the root of uh, uh, discoveries about self-intimacy and self-relation, including self-mourning, um, that I think is um, a crucial um, effect of the design of the book. Um, I, I remember Eve and I and other um, interlocutors of our, ours in gay and lesbian studies in the late 1980s giving talks that were in, inflected by psychoanalytic theory, and this was not recent psychoanalytic theory, but, but uh, engaging with certain kind of traditional Freudian paradigms around practices like mourning and melancholy and so on. And some colleagues, feminist and gender studies colleagues coming up to us afterwards and saying, like, are you, are you leaving Freud the way? <clears throat> and it sounded like, are you, are you losing your faith? <laughs> and we, we had left Freud as far as accepting these paradigms as, uh, as uh, just what was there or the natural recourse that we would have to understanding um, emotionally and psychically challenging experiences that we were going through both collectively as a group and individually as, as uh, call us what you will, people. And, and I just wanted to say that, you know, the, the anecdote that I read about her going to Shannon's house, you know, after he had had surgery, I mean, that would be like anathema to yeah. a, a psychoanalytic 
perspective, right? I mean, it's not only... Not to mention his handing over his notes for her. Right, exactly, you know, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I think that, that actually, you know, um, insofar as, you know, all psychotherapy in some sense is, um, you know, within, the hori within a horizon that, you know, uh, it, Freud precipitated in a certain sense. Um, I think that the book actually has a very sustained critique of the limits of psychoanalysis as a healing modality. And I think that, and for me, that's why I love that moment, you know, because it's like she's bringing him lunch. He's just had surgery. They, she's been in the hospital. Yeah, and it's like that there's a, a um, the, the dynamic that would be defined as transference and countertransference is completely insufficient to explain, you know, what that moment of human interaction is. And I think it's precisely that moment that she's trying to call our attention to, you know, as what it, the, the place in which we work on ourselves. what you have to say about the form of the book, but I have a comment about it myself, which has to do with love, and it's specifically about the way Eve makes it clear that she loves us, insofar as uh, she begins the book um, talking about her depression and remi uh, reminds us all by telling Shannon that she's always felt the wish to die, and ends the book in um, Shannon's voice, chooses one of Shannon's notes to end the book with Shannon. Eve always wanted to make sure that we would be okay. Um, and uh, she ends the book with, in Shannon's voice, say, uh, you know, putting the voice of the book into the other place, as uh, Shannon saying that she could hear a voice like my voice inside herself saying, you can stop now. I guess I have to keep starting and stopping the book. Stopping and starting the book, it's the only way I can read it. Um, I'm very interested in its formal innovations and their effective charge. Uh, I mentioned the, the, not just the recursion to haiku form, but the always going back and forth between prose and haiku and then back to prose. And also from dialogue, insofar as, in a way, part of the mission of the book is to show how Shannon Van Way, the therapist, and Eve Sedgwick, the theorist, and but also suffering subject, if you will, um, could only talk to each other in certain kind of relatively well-worn modalities. And as you suggest in your comment and question, that they, in a way, learn to speak in each other's dialects. And um, I think um, that for that reason, the book is also an important instantiation of Eve's later work on what she thought of as her project on Buddha, a Buddhist pedagogy, a very different way of, of teaching and learning to teach and learning from students um, from the one that most of us came out of graduate school into the classroom practicing. So. Um, I would be interested to hear more from any of you who have thoughts about it, about the um, kind of generic experimentation and shifts over the career of Eve's writing, because um, um, haiku is such a famously concise and formally precise um, form and to call a book a dialogue on love is um, almost to challenge readers to pick up the book wondering like how, is this book presenting itself to me as a potential reader as something like an enlargement on Plato <laughs> Do, doing it over and doing it right um, more generously more lovingly so um, and I think Eve was uh, remarkably self-aware at this point in her writing career that she was doing everything from sort of um, sampling platonic dialogue, but in a kind of no holds barred way, and at the same time continually recurring to kind of cooking it down into the 
uh, through the eye of a needle perspective of haiku, and then coming right back out of that into uh, situations of the kind that Ed is uh, remarking and marveling over, and I, I share your, your awe and fascination of arriving at your therapist's door, and he's, he's you know, bedridden and, and convalescing, and, and you've brought the, the shrink lunch, so... Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot of formal experimentation going on here, but I think that we're uh, used to thinking of that as a kind of deadening thing to even start talking about. But this, this book shows some of the ways in which it can continue to be so enlivening after the literal death of the author insofar as Eve has died, which are gathering here today and talking about her, her and her writing all day suggests that it's a lot more complicated than we might have assumed. And just to follow on that, I mean, the, <clears throat> and the thing that I, the reason that I was evoking Foucault's final words, where he thinks about truth in terms of these two possibilities: the other life, which is the Platonic moment; I mean, the other world, which is the Platonic moment, and the other life, which is the Cynics moment, um, is that, and that that we've kind of historically, collectively, you know, pose those as oppositional. And one of the things that I think is very wonderful about um, a dialogue in love is it precisely doesn't hold those two things apart. And not only that, I mean, I think in, the, in terms of the formalness of it, I mean, I thought, I think a lot about it in terms of things about weaving and, and you know, taking strands that could be discontinuous and then providing them with a, another set of strings that allow them to come into some kind of a coherence. And, you know, the haiku form, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, what the intentionality of it, but, I mean, it's so um, particular, and it seems to me in the book it works as a kind of um, gesture towards the desire that she's reclaiming to be a poet um, in a very kind of you know precise way, um, and that that you know is one of the um, uh, one of the textures <clears throat> that is being kind of gathered um, in this particular text, and that that would be you know one of the possibilities you know through which she herself you know was able to bring these two modalities together i mean pedagogy would be another really wonderful you know place to interrogate it so i i, I think you know almost i mean i think this was the the point that Michael was making at the end, almost to, to ask it, um, and I don't think this was the intention of your question, but, but to, it was just how my mind thinks about it, that, you know, to put like the formal, you know, in, as distinct from, you know, the, um, the, the rhetorical or the effective or the transformational, you know, in a way is what the book I think is trying to trouble, or at least for me, it troubles that distinction. <laughs> no. I, I find, um, sorry, one of the interesting things is the shifts in voice and the radical distinctions that that entails, um, enables is this, the, you know the interesting little who's dumb and who's smart and how you can tell who's dumb and whether they're becoming smarter, the perpetual worry that, <laughs> that Shannon's being really dumb, um, I think by uh, allowing us access to his notes and those places where you can't really tell whose notes they are, that her later realization that maybe that hasn't been the best criterion to use kind of, you get some, some senses made of that, that shift. Because um, we, we as kind of readers of those are sometimes thinking, well, gee, it seems like what Shannon is saying is pretty smart. What's the, <laughs> you know, why is this, why is this intervention on the part of the therapist being, being read as dumb. So I think there's a lot of little um, mini dialogues within the, um, particularly in the interplay between the notes, that is a, a highly controlled formal intervention. There are other formal interventions that may be less well controlled. Uh, yes, mini dialogues. Um, I'm Anne Flash, and uh, also speaking to Carolyn Williams' question about the um, or a comment, I guess, about the, uh, the caring element of the book. Um, it's very moving to me to hear this session after the last session, um, because the books uh, seem to me to now to speak to each other interestingly. Um, when I read this, I thought, what is she talking about a dialogue? 
surely there's more than two people in here. I mean, how many people are in here? How many voices? How many generic shifts are happening? Many, multi. And uh, it made me think in some way that it was about how can there be only one writer when there are so many voices? How is that possible? That's not what's, that's not what's really happening. And uh, that you can't have only one voice. Um, and isn't that a family problem, first of all? Isn't, that, isn't the family where you, where you maybe where you find that out uh, first? That you can't be multiple people. You have to subordinate yourself to the unit or you have to, you have to speak in the way that people expect you to speak. Um, so that was kind of, I think, what I heard in the, in the generic shifting in the book and also uh, that the haiku seemed to me to be very much about the problem of communication, that they aren't really about communicating, in a sense, anything. They're always about communicating uh, an experience that is fleeting and, and ephemeral. So I guess that's really a comment, not a question. But sorry. <laughs> Um, well, that's that. Uh, Heather Love, um, and I just wanted to revisit this question of the psychological or the psychoanalytic, and it, it seemed to me, Cindy, that you weren't even necessarily talking about the psychological, that your kind of resistance could be thought about in terms of subject and structure. It was really more just about the personal um, and a kind of discomfort with the genre and even a discomfort with the genre of your talk today, in a sense. Um, and so um, I guess that relates to genre as well. But I wanted to ask maybe just more at the level of content or as a reading of that moment of the two diagnoses in the text, if you felt like the move to structure, I mean, you seem to be kind of uncomfortable about it, like it was a kind of betrayal. But I wondered if you thought that it was you were kind of reading what was really going on in the text or you know, it was kind of unpacking it or if thinking about it at the level of family and the level of structural homology and kind of making this, this move to the general was actually reading against a kind of what was impl already implicit in the text. Is there kind of congruity or structural homology, I guess, between your reading and, and w what's happening at the level of the personal? Or does moving to structure actually mean that your reading is much more in tension or contradictory with what's already there? I'm not really sure. I think I have to go back and kind of push that. Um, I think what I, you know, resonating or following Bourdieu would say is that you can't really understand that intensely individual personal without understanding the sort of constituent context of it. We used to say the personal is political, and that means nothing anymore. It's been <laughs> evacuated of all meaning. But I think that, to be more precise, to take that sentiment and state it more precisely is that you cannot understand, you can't understand them without the other. Um, so for me, I think my discomfort with the text is the fleeting, the fleeting gestures toward a larger scene, but the, it's so intensely about the kind of, that, that scene, that actual scene, that I think um, somehow those larger movements that would would add nuance and compassion and, you know, misery uh, are, are sort of left as individual traits. So I, I want to defend the book against readers who just sort of say, oh, there's, you know, some neurotic person and here's their, um, here's their little story. But I don't find a huge amount of places to point to in the text to defend it against that reading, I guess is my kind of anxiety. Um, even though I know that she could say the things about feminism and all these other things that she said in other places, but they don't work them. They don't work themselves into that text um, as explicitly as I would have liked. And then the the dream work that happens in there, I think, is a takes the text toward a particular reading that um, also pulls it away from kind of thinking about the problem of the family. All right, I think we have time for about one more question. Somebody, or that you said there were two people? I, the I other person never spoke? I don't know. Let's go. I'll let you choose. Oh, well, I just, I was thinking when Carolyn, I'm sorry, I'm Mary Campbell. Um, 
when Carolyn was asking her question about something she wrote a long time ago when she and Eve were both at BU about Virginia Woolf and the dilating and expanding um, pupil. Do you remember this? It was about Virginia Woolf's eating issues. And, it, and when you were talking about the going back and forth constantly from this tiny constricted form of the haiku to the large, expansive, endless sentences of Eve's prose, it just made me think that one of the terms that hasn't come up today, and I wasn't sure whether it would come up in the afternoon, was fat. Um, and that one of the things about dialogue and love, which, am I right, it follows directly after fat art, thin art? Was it the next book after fat art, thin art? Um, that one of the things that book seems to do is constantly, you know, change weights, <laughs> shrink down and expand, and, and both of those things feel extremely pleasurable when they're happening, that constant going back and forth between them. So I just wondered if anyone in relation to this issue, because she is an artist, and the book is a work of art, and therefore not as explicit, uh, I think that's part of why it's not as explicit as you would like it to be, it is, uh, uh, there is a lot of poesis going on, as there might be in a novel, um, not by Dickens, though also by Dickens. Um, but is there something happening here uh, that has to do with this business of fat, which is, was made much more complicated for some of us at her memorial in New York when we realized, looking at all these pictures of her over her life, that she wasn't fat. Um, so if anyone could talk about fat and thin... I don't know it as a feminist tradition. I'm thinking of it as a male celebrity tradition that from Lord Byron to Elvis, and that describes a pretty broad arc, uh, <laughs> that these, these male celebrities, part of their super celebrity is that they were always simultaneously gaining and losing immense amounts of weight. And they, were, they always looked both fatter and thinner than uh, they had the last time one had been aware of, <laughs> of them. And... Uh, Eve's persistence in denominating herself fat and taking up this public uh, role as a, a fat woman, beginning from the time that she and I, in our work and uh, talk on John Waters' divine, because we chose the, the emotion divinity for the WIS conference, conference on the emotions, choose one. And that was uh, ab uh, Ab defiance and abjection was uh, our, our way of defining divinity. Um, uh, Eve used to love the saying, I've got my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> and her work had a lot of uh, impact on, um, on like, uh, you know, anti-obese phobia uh, kinds of activism that... Uh, sprung up in its wake, not, of course, entirely from her work, but she was a routinely cited uh, um, authority and, and uh, originator for that set of discourses and debates about whether people just were fat or had a right to be fat or had a right not to be bugged about being fat by their families, among other people. So... Um, I'm just struck by your comment that uh, it was it was more Eve's persistence in uh, in having this role of a fat person and mentioning size as one of the one of the variables that that were uh, got laden with immense um, uh, burdens of signification in the in in the social uh, binaries that were enforced so relentlessly and at times murderously. Um, fat art, thin art. Now I don't know what to think about that title because it sounds like it might be about um, Byron and Elvis and all the male celebrities between them. And it's uh, it's about Eve's uh, Eve's poetry. And I guess because we're taking this kind of retrospective look today, her career as a poet, which was uh, in a way much more complicated and. Uh, fraught, perhaps, than her career as a feminist theorist or a queer theorist. Uh, one of the things I think about the haiku is that it began in, fat, in uh, dialogue on love as a kind of manifestation of her, of her long James Merrill envy. <laughs> and uh, uh, she, you know, didn't just end up, but was already at that time elaborating a literary career 
and a career of autopoiesis that uh, James Merrill and a lot of other uh, male celebrity poets might well have envied its richness and complexity itself, but uh, otherwise I don't know what to say about it. Can we briefly do one more? Did other of you want to comment? I think actually we're, we're almost out of time. We wanted to um, also uh, uh, show a short film. Yeah, and um, Keith Vincent is going to introduce the film for us. So thank you. Please thank, join me in thank you. Before we uh, break today, um, uh, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce a, a, a very short video that was actually made for Eve's uh, memorial uh, celebration in New York um, by Brian Selznick and uh, David Serlin, who can't be here today, but um, who uh, sent this video. Um, uh, it has no words. Um, it's um, just images. I think we've had lots of words this morning, so maybe uh, it'll be a nice note to go out on uh, to uh, attach whatever meanings you um, you'd like to attach to it. <laughs> 